Welcome back to the podcast. Today is a special podcast. I have the honor and joy of introducing one of my very best friends, Adam Contos. Today, we're going to talk about the profound impact of mentoring, and Adam shares how he went from being a police officer to running one of the largest global real estate companies in the world. So, Adam, where did you grow up, and what was your early life and family like? I was uh, born in Ohio. We moved to, my, my dad worked for the federal government, so we moved around a fair amount until he decided he didn't want to move anymore and move his family but um, we ended up, by the time I was probably three, four years old, we ended up in uh, Inglewood, Colorado, just south of Denver, where I grew up. I remember watching them take dynamite and blast out the, uh, the foundations of the houses around in the neighborhood. We would hide behind Remax signs in the area as they were doing that. So it was, it was a great childhood. I really appreciate all that my mom and dad gave us. They, uh, my mom was at home most of the time, so we'd have a home-cooked dinner every night. Uh, Saturday was pizza night where we would watch The Muppet Show and have our one can of soda for the week um, and some homemade pizza. We did, and we did a lot of things as a family locally. So we would, we would go on walks and go out and my dad would take my brother and I out in the field and we would shoot at grasshoppers with our BB guns and things like that. So it was, it was a very, it was a great childhood, uh, supportive, um, good family and uh, very wholesome. So you completed high school. What did you do then? As soon as I graduated high school, the day after I graduated high school, I went to Marine Corps boot camp. All my friends were going off to parties and getting ready to go to college and things like that. And I was going to stand on the yellow footprints at Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego, California, and uh, started boot camp realistically the day after uh, I graduated high school. After serving in the Marines, Adam started in a civilian position at Cherry Hills Police Department. At the age of 21, he was approached to go to the police academy after graduating from the academy, he was hired as a Douglas County police officer and eventually went on to join the SWAT team. The SWAT team is a very unique uh, animal within a law enforcement agency when you look at special teams overall. So I wanted to be the best that I could possibly be. And I knew that every day I put on the badge and the vest and the, the gun belt and got in the patrol car, my life was potentially on the line. Um, we obviously dealt with some horrible criminals and some crazy situations, but I wanted to be the best that I could be. And I thought, what a better place than on the SWAT team. And one of my training officers was on the SWAT team. Uh, another one had been a canine handler and I had worked with the SWAT team a little bit that way, but they had an interest in me because of my knowledge of the weapon systems and tactics being in the military. And I had an interest in them because they had extraordinarily high standards so I tested for the SWAT team and was accepted to the SWAT team. And it was really a, a cool thing to be part of. What was the most difficult aspect of being on the SWAT team? I think it was a combination of juggling different priorities. For instance, you, you had so many trainings, you had call outs, but you also had your personal life and you wore a pager everywhere. Anytime there was something going on, they would page us. And we had to respond to that. So you had to balance your personal life around being on call. And you didn't want to let your your partners on the SWAT team down. You didn't want to let uh, the rest of your teammates hang because you did not show up for a SWAT call because maybe you had a, you know, been out drinking or you know were doing something that would prohibit you from uh, being behind a firearm. So it it was interesting juggling all of the aspects of that as well as maintaining the physical fitness standards the firearm standards the learning and knowledge standards because you were always learning and doing debriefs on other SWAT calls or studying uh, the hardened targets within your jurisdiction and those that you serve we would serve multiple jurisdictions on our team uh, we got transported to the western slope a couple times we would um, would get called out to different agencies that needed help so um, it was basically understanding that emotional maturity of how to manage your time and resources to be the best that you could be. So looking back well over 20 years ago, 
uh, I showed up at the request of the sheriff to do a ride along with this young policeman, Adam Contos. What crossed your mind? What did you think when you first met me? And um, how did that evening progress? I, I was intimidated, of course. I knew I was with somebody special, and I knew of your reputation and your, your leadership. First thing I did was I checked you out because you had a gun and a badge on you. I looked at you and I made sure that you were set up to my patrol standards. <laughs> and the moment that we're doing 129 miles an hour going to an officer needs help call, and you're kind of leaning against the, the window looking out your the passenger window, and I said, hey, we're doing 129 miles an hour. And you looked at me and you said, is that all the faster this thing will go? I wanted to make sure I had my ducks in a row and that, that I impressed you, but at the same time that you saw the true me. And that way we could work together in a trusting manner where we were on calls together. On one of those calls, I had a chance to witness Adam's leadership in action. He had to reprimand one of his direct reports, but he chose to give him a phone call rather than use the radio. I was curious why he made that decision. We had car to car where, you know, you could, we, we call them chit chat channels where you would have conversation, but you, everybody could hear it. And even if it wasn't a recorded channel, it was still being monitored by others. And it's not, it's just not fair to discuss potential improvement opportunities with people in front of others in circumstances like that. It's impersonal on the radio. Um, and it doesn't allow for somebody to push back or give feedback. So uh, you, you mentioned that situation to me in the past. And when I do have a feedback moment, uh, that it, and it does happen quite a bit, I reflect on that because that is one of those key moments of leadership that you know, have become a Dave Linegar leadership lesson. You know, treat people with dignity and respect, which means how they feel about who they're around when you're talking to them is important as well. I always say the best CEOs come from sales and marketing because you can't teach people how to smile. Interpersonal skills, empathy, self-awareness, and communication are key traits to all great leaders. Sometimes people get put in a certain box in life, and it doesn't matter if they've been convicted of a crime and put in you know, a detention center, or maybe they're being held uh, for on bond or something like that, that, um, that they haven't been able to pay. So they are still being detained, waiting for the court process to operate. But ultimately, I figured out that if you, if you treat people with dignity and respect, and you give them some feeling of that, typically, that starts with a smile, and a greeting and a how are you and things like that, it goes a long way. And sometimes we have to remind people in those very difficult situations that we are being respectful to them so that they can see that because they might be so tied up in their emotions that they're just angry. But when we say to them, I just, I wanna try and find a win-win here to the best of my ability and do it with respect and dignity for you, it allows them to see that that's your approach. So I learned a lot about interpersonal communication and dealing with an inmate, because you, you could end up in a fist fight with an inmate at the drop of a hat, simply because you say the wrong thing. Adam served the Douglas County Police Department for 11 years. By the time he left, he was a SWAT team commander. I wanted to know what he found to be the best part of serving the community as a police officer. The most rewarding aspect, I would say, was being able to help people. I just love helping people. And that was either, you know, a very difficult hostage situation or SWAT call all the way to there was one day that I remember that I was driving my patrol car. This is at night, so it's dark out. And there are a lot of dark parts of the jurisdiction. It's 844 square miles. I ran across a car that was on the side of the road with the hazards on, and you can see clearly see there was a flat tire. So I stopped and I'm like, everything okay here? And it was a pregnant lady. And she said, no, I have a flat tire. I'm like, okay, uh, let me change that for you. Do you have a spare tire? And she said, yeah, I think so. So I changed the tire for her and got her on her way. And it was very rewarding personally in my heart to be able to help her. That night, I actually ran across another pregnant lady who had a flat tire also. So in one night, two pregnant women 
with flat tires all by themselves out in the middle of nowhere. And that was, of all the crazy, weird situations I'd been in, that day sticks in my mind because I got to help those two ladies and it really made a difference to them. I saw that Adam had great interpersonal skills and the potential to be a CEO of Remax one day, but he would have to start over in an entry-level role in a completely new industry. This meant leaving his successful consulting business and leaving the SWAT team commander position. I was taking a step backwards, a substantial step backwards. Dealing with people is dealing with people. It didn't matter if you were pulling up on a pregnant lady with a flat tire or you were walking into a franchise to do business consulting. It was meeting somebody you don't know, understanding their challenges and earning their trust and confidence, and then helping them collaboratively to overcome those challenges to find greater successes. And those are the transferable skills that I think go from just about any place to any place else if you realize that those are the skills that you have to have. And then I continued to build upon those skills to work my way back up at Remax because I knew how to build upon those skills as a leader to capture that without threatening other people above me, but at the same time giving to everybody and helping the company grow. Well, in essence, even though I knew your leadership ability, uh, nobody else in the company did. And it was obvious that we were very close friends. And so all of a sudden you've got this question of, was he just getting ahead because favoritism of a best friend? Or did he get in, set the records, uh, turn losing divisions into winning divisions, and thereby being respected for what you accomplished instead of you were my friend to begin with? And that worked out very well for both you and me. Yeah, there was a lot of prove it going on. <laughs> and I was okay with that. I'm all about prove it. You even told me that though. You said, you're going to have to prove your way up. You're going to have to show them that you are a leader, that you have what it takes. Because that is really the only way that leaders create followers and other leaders is by proving it. So get out there and do it. Even as the founder of the company and you had a full-time CEO working for you, you were still proving it every day. You're like, hey, put me on the phone with this particular customer. I want to make sure everything's okay with them. It was about doing what I saw you doing and understanding what you told me I had to do. So thank you for the insight. And that's that's one of those leadership levers that you're like, how'd you do it in 20 years instead of 50? It's because I, I listened. And you always said that this is the interesting part of our relationship is you take my recommendations and you run with them. And I think that's something everybody listening to this should understand is there's a lot of wisdom out there. Don't think you're smarter than that wisdom. Go and take that wisdom and exercise it and see what you can gain from it. Literally dozens of people have asked for us to mentor them. And we have a huge following. The problem is when you mentor somebody, you want them to execute not just nod their head and say, that's a good idea. And the vast majority of the people that we mentor do not really change their behaviors at all. They listen. It's like going to a seminar, take notes all day long, put their notes aside and never look at it again. And in reality, if you have that opportunity where somebody takes you under their wing, uh, it's your obligation to do something with it. You don't have to do what they say to do, but do something with the knowledge they give you. That's gold. That is one of the key points that I picked up immediately when you started mentoring me is, I can't let him down by not doing something between now and next time I see him with what he just told me. What did you notice about your transition from going from uh, military cop to business leader? One of the biggest aha moments I've had with that is that people believe they're stuck where they're at. And I get asked a lot by different law enforcement officers, firefighters, uh, other government employees, or just people in the military. I get phone calls all the time. I've been on podcasts about this where people say, what can I go do and how do I get out of where I'm at? And ultimately it boils down to what do you want to become? You looked at me and you knew I was an entrepreneur. I was running my consulting company and, and did some work in the real estate space, but I knew I could become more than what I was doing in law enforcement. I looked at it and I knew that if I can build a great team like that, that wants to support and uplift the organization and help people the best that they can and help me to have the time and the opportunity to make myself better, to re-deliver back to them, I can do it anywhere. 
it was a very interesting situation I found myself in, in that uh, as you age, the next generation is younger, faster, smarter, and I knew I was aging. Uh, I'm still pretty smart, but obviously time <laughs> rages on, I guess. I went to the board and I said, look, it's time for me to transition out of the CEO role. I'd like to make Adam my co-CEO for a year. I'll give him one of my direct reports every month and slide him into the CEO position full time. And they said incredulously, he doesn't even have a college degree. And I said, neither do I. And I know that you'd thought about college a couple of times and just decided at the time it wasn't for you. You excelled at everything you did in Remax. And so I went to you and said, look, I want you to be my CEO, but my public board says you have to have a degree. I said, how would you feel about the hard job of running this company and getting your MBA at the same time? Your reaction was, I'll do what I have to do. So tell me about that thought process. And the thing is, most amazing about that thought process is I failed out of college three times. Uh, it wasn't because I was stupid. I was immature. I was young. I was undisciplined. I didn't know what I wanted. Then I look at you, and you got a perfect 4.0 in a master's program without an undergraduate degree. What's this transition? How did this happen? I love the challenge that you threw at me. That was probably one of the biggest challenges I've ever had. I've always wanted to check that box in my life and go back as a seasoned veteran in business to truly understand the application of academia and, and the philosophies to business. What I did was I just took the application of the systems that I had learned under you and through life as a leader and applied those to my education in order to get a 4.0 in, in a very prestigious and difficult executive MBA program. But it was fun because I got to be better out of it. And the thing's interesting at DU, which is one of the best business schools in the country, you are now a professor for the university teaching leadership. Yeah, it's full circle, isn't it? It's kind of kind of fun. I get to teach uh, executive leadership and executive presence there to MBAs and executive MBAs. And I also get to guest lecture at some other institutions that I've been to recently. So it's really kind of neat how when you devote some effort to something, you get paid back with opportunity of helping others with it. I've told you several times uh, how proud I am of how you have grown in the company. But you actually made more progress in 20 years coming out of law enforcement in Remax than I did in 50 years with Remax. How's that come about? First of all, it's a humbling thing to hear from you. So thank you. I, I want to say that I listened to something you said early on, and that was learn from my lessons. The premise of how Remax was built was you were willing to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. You're not avoiding challenges, you're charging into them headlong and then learning what you can from them. So I understood that that's the situation. And I knew that if I deployed that when I got to Remax and then obviously instituted a little bit of the thick skin that I had gained in law enforcement, because there was nothing that anybody was going to say to me that I hadn't been told before, and they certainly weren't shooting at me. So I knew that I could take the learning moments from everything that happened on a daily basis and reflect on those with an open mind in order to find success. That was probably one of the largest leadership levers that you ever gave me was to understand that concept. Thinking back on your career with Remax, what was the hardest, grittiest thing you had to do? Oh, that's an easy one. Keep up with you. <laughs> I mean, seriously, when you look at grit and ambition and the meaning of those words, it's, it's about having the endurance and the patience to continue doing it, even when you're getting beat up and beat down, yelled at and pressured and challenged. We've made business our sport and our lifestyle and our love, as opposed to it just being a job. We we'll love what you do, do what you love. That's what we're doing right now. What do you... Um most excited about, let's say, your future? Changing people's lives. 
that's one thing that you did a just an absolutely stand-up job of at Remax is changing people's lives. You've always said that we create an environment where people can be as successful as they want to be. And then we inspire them to find that success. We've got this opportunity in what we do to change lives. And I'm very appreciative of that. And that's what I'm most excited about in the future. I think that you've done a better job of finding some kind of life balance between being a husband, a father, a citizen, a fellow worker, etc. What do you attribute that to? We, we always say life balance. You just said life balance, even though you're the first one to say there's no balance in life. We're on this wild ride and it's a matter of holding on and, and changing seats while we're flying the plane. The reality is it's life intention. You know, that's really what balance is, is making sure that you're giving equal effort to every side, but it's intentional. I've learned that being intentional is a huge part of finding success. Again, I, I said it before, how you do one thing is how you do all things. Don't neglect those all things in order to succeed on that one thing. I remember before I started with Remax, I was going through a divorce and you sat me down and you gave me some life lessons. You kind of hit me over the head with a two by four and said, all right, you're in a funk. Let me break you out of that because you need to understand that you need to take a look at your life holistically and be the best that you can be to your kids, to your soon to be ex, to your future relationships, to your friends, your family as a whole, don't drop the ball. And then when I started going through my MBA, you know, you've got three parts of your life now. You have your family, you have your MBA, and you have your work. You're going to neglect one of those each day. Just don't make it the same one two days in a row. It's life effort and life attention for the right reasons instead of just randomly doing stuff. Well, you've accomplished a great deal in your life so far. What are you most proud of? I think I'm most proud of the security and opportunity that I've been able to give my family. We all want to make a difference. It's whether or not we try to make a difference. And I wanted to be able to make a difference for anybody that I come in contact with. For instance, I get to do great things for my mom or for my dad. I, you know, have been able to take my brother and his family on trips. Same thing for my sister. I like to have the feeling in my heart that not only am I giving my wife and my kids a great life, but I'm also able to share it outward from there. I've done great things and I'm super proud of the opportunities and the ability to, to deliver that to others. Last thought, just for fun. We've become incredibly close friends. Our families are very close. We've got a tight knit group of about seven or eight men and women that have been working together now for many years. A lot of respect, a lot of friendship. What's the most fun thing you can remember doing with me? <laughs> I would say when I'm standing on the back of a dive boat somewhere in the South Pacific, and there's just a whole bunch of sharks circling in the water. And I look at you and I, I said, well, there's a bunch of sharks here. And you said, we'll jump through them. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning into today's show. Adam and Dave's friendship and mentoring relationship is inspiring. To keep up with Adam, please check out his podcast, Start With a Win, or visit adamcontos.com. Until next time, remember everything in life worth having takes a little ambition and grit.